Angel is brought to you by LinkedIn. You already know LinkedIn as the world's largest professional network. It's also a better way to find great talent. Go to linkedin.com slash angel and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. And Embroker. The Embroker Startup Program helps startups secure the most important lines of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. For a guaranteed 10% off on premiums and up to 20% depending on quote, go to embroker.com slash angel. Hey, everybody, welcome back to season three of Angel, the podcast. Yes, this is the Angel podcast, which is a compliment, an ongoing discussion for my book, Angel, which you may have read. If you haven't, where have you been? Angelthebook.com, now in three or four languages, Japanese, Chinese, English, and about seven more languages to go. If you want to hang out with me, Jason Calacanis, investor in seven unicorns, uh, the mother of all unicorns. You can come to angel.university. I'm going on tour to visit the East Coast. And uh, then we're going to be doing Sydney in June. We're going to be doing Angel University, which is just a five-hour course on angel investing for about 25 to 50 people in the room. Sometimes we go as high as 75, sometimes as low as just 20. Um, and it's a great course. I teach it with my friend, Mike Savino. And what we're trying to do is just explain to you early stage investing. It's something that is incredibly opaque, and you've probably been hit up many times by friends and family. Hey, invest in this company. Meet this founder. What you have to realize is that if you're on the outside and you're seeing deal flow, in all likelihood, it's the deal flow that has been passed over by the top investors. In other words, you're investing in the anti portfolio. That's why you need to get educated. That's why you need to read my book, which will cost you 10 or 20 bucks. If you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. You can send the book back. Uh, and you should come to the course and learn. And you should watch this free podcast. We've now done uh, two seasons. This is our third season. So we'll have 30 uh, interviews for you to listen to from world-class investors. And today will be no different. Matt Ako is somebody I've been watching and studying for decades here in Silicon Valley. He is the co-founder of Data Collective with Zach Bogue, um, who is Miss Mar Marissa Mayer. For people who don't know, he is the husband of the famed Marissa Mayer, CEO of Yahoo. Uh, welcome to the program, Matt Ako. Thanks for having me, Jason. Uh, so just to give people a little bit of background, I know you've been doing this for two or three decades now. 25 years. 25 years of investing. Uh, give us some broad strokes. How did you start in investing? And um, tell us the scope of your activities today. Okay. So uh, I got my start because I worked with a, a friend on uh, actually the precursor to Adobe Acrobat. So okay. he and one friend wrote almost all of the technology that Adobe, uh, what's the polite way of putting it, paid homage to uh, <laughs> in, uh, in the development of Acrobat. Um, and uh, it turned out that his godfather and longtime family friend um, ran, I guess in today's dollars, uh, nearly a billion dollar evergreen fund. Uh, and he was looking for a young, crazy technologist uh, to scout deals in Silicon Valley. And the only quid pro quo was that I had to live roughly half time in uh, Toronto, Canada in the early 90s. Wow. And so uh, I had uh, two cars, um, uh, uh, two places to live, two sets of furniture, um, two big screen TV indulgences, uh, and no social life. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I was the uh, I was the loneliest investor that uh, that that you could. So find. you just had this like um, L solo LP, who just put you in business and said, "Hey, start making investments." Well, he 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 was a fascinating guy. Uh, he, I mean, he he was, I think, uh, the secret uh, model for the most interesting man in the world. Um, on a lark, he walked naked and daubed with ritual paint into a cave um, in uh, Western Africa uh, with, a, with a tribal leader and walked out with a billion dollar gold deal. Um, he opened the, and backed the first McDonald's in Russia. Uh, he'd made and lost, I think, 
three or four one billion. Wait, what's the name fortunes. of this guy? It's a guy named Ben Webster. Wow. Yeah, it's just a, a brilliant, brilliant, charismatic, lovely guy. Unfortunately, he he passed uh, from from cancer in uh, kind of the mid to late um, mid to late nineties. But it was it was essentially his money and a few select outside LPs, and he could do whatever he wanted, which was a fantastic way to start wow. a career. Wow. So you get this mentorship. And then today, give us the size of the, give us the scale of your operations. You invest in how many companies a year? What's your average check size, the range? And what do you look for? What is your thesis these days? So uh, my, my life is, uh, is split into my day job, which is uh, DCVC. We're a, a deep tech focused fund. We're looking for a technology that's powered by a unique algorithmic edge that has a massive CapEx and OpEx advantage uh, against proprietary data in a scary large industry, ideally disdained by others, that when it works, transforms or upends that industry. So um, deep tech. Deep tech. In difficult markets. In difficult markets. And uh, the reason you want to go into difficult markets is what? Because most people would say, oh, music industry, oh, construction, oh, education, oh, healthcare, oh, the military. These are industries filled with incumbents and it's too slow. And you're saying you want to go into the slow, protected, moated, giant incumbent space, which sounds like a recipe for failure. It looks scary, mm -hmm. but our job is to produce extraordinary alpha. Our RLPs aren't happy unless... Our funds, uh, uh, you know, in aggregate, are returning a minimum of three times cash on cash, and ideally five, six, seven, uh, or better. And over a decade long life, yeah, life. over over ten to twelve years. And one of the things that we observe, because we're data driven guys, the, the history of our name is evident in yeah. Data Collective, is that the risk and capital for being in the fourth. Wi-Fi chip deal, the fifth flash storage deal, the seventh click three hearts on a survey to show that you're not a disgruntled employee fluffy SaaS deal is actually the same, if not greater, hmm. because of a lack of differentiation, because of access to the market by an endless array of venture-funded competitors, because the path to success is clear to every possible competitor. And by the way, once you're in the market, success is relatively stochastic, even with a very good CEO and- and Stochastic. Yes. Wow. Meaning <laughs> First time I've gotten yeah. a word on the podcast I didn't know. <clears throat> stochastic. I, I, I get a stoic in there, kind no, of. No. Lar no? Uh, Explain the uh, large epistemology of this. Yes. Uh, a, a, fancy, a fancy word meaning largely random. Largely so, random. Exactly. I, I'm understanding your thesis here, Matt. You're saying that because there is so much attention towards what I'll call the, the clearer path to victory, the easier business. I'm going to build a SaaS product like Jason Lemkin's investing in SaaS. Because there's so many people who want to do that because it feels less risky. It feels like there's less um, downside because there's so many people going over going after it, now there is more downside because too many people are chasing the same piece of cheese. Exactly. Whereas in your space, because so many people are scared of doing deep tech in difficult markets with incumbents, it actually evens out or maybe even gets better. Right. So if you look at what you're aiming for, um, so I'll use a, uh, another, another fancy word, um, fractal. Fractal. So so if you look at the weird kind of repetition of the power law that exists at the tail end of the power law hmm. curve, you say, okay, in that long tail of scary, hard to understand stuff, what produces monopolies? Ah. It actually turns out that getting a monopoly or at least oligopoly scale return hmm. is less risky when you have a lower price because nobody understands what the heck the you're doing in the industry or what the lower team, valuation you know, of the company yeah lower lower entry price you spend less money on internecine warfare the company Wait, has, what does that mean means you're not fighting 73 other companies all taking your prices down to zero Got it. in a desperate bid to survive a grueling 
two year enterprise checklist sale, mm. right? So that's another characteristic of the markets that we're in. If if you do a deep tech company and it's successful, almost by definition, it has life or death technology. Mm. So, um, you know, one of our companies, in fact, one that uh, one that I'm uh, uh, very proud of. It's it's not not my deal. My colleague uh, Scott Barkley um, sits on uh, uh, sits on the board. It's a company called MIC Medical Informatics. And they built machine learning algorithms against a huge proprietary data set in uh, uh, neonatal intensive care units and pediatric intensive care units. Hmm. And so without any new equipment, without new doctors, new nurses, without radical changes to procedures, apples to apples in major hospitals, they've reduced death rates for the most vulnerable patients anywhere between 30 and 50%. That's hundreds of kids going home with their parents alive when the outcome would have been otherwise, and moreover with high quality of life because the algorithms can predict hours to days to weeks ahead of time before the wow. alarms go off shrieking, code blue, before doctors and nurses are forced to make horrific decisions with poor data in very small amounts of time. This forestalls all of that. Hmm. And By studying what, like the blood sugar level, the heart rate, ev everything, 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 every one of those machines. And so not only that, but the machine's alarms are now turned off. So the kids sleep, they're not stressed, they're healing Amazing. faster. So that's, that's in a, that's in a very difficult area. What's the name of that company again? M M I C medical informatics Corp. Right. But well, my, my point is yeah. no one is going to shut that off. Right? No, now, no, right? no, 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 now, no, no, Now that it works, no- It's essential. Right. Um, you know- uh, So that's the bet. If, if, it, if this works, the bet you're making as an investor is to say, this is going to be very hard. It's going to be a long time to figure out if this deep technology works, but if it does, you can't not use it. Exactly. All right. When we get back from this break, I want you to take me through what process- uh, data collective uses to figure out if this company, which obviously if it's deep tech, doesn't have a product in market. How do you qualify a company without traction, without a product in market for investment at the data collective when we get back on Angel the Podcast? If you need to hire somebody, go to LinkedIn. That's how I'm finding all my great people. Charles, who works with us in the studio and records This Week in Startups, we found him. He had a full-time job, but he was a passive job seeker. What that means is he wasn't out there actively looking, but when he was on LinkedIn getting messages from his friends and updating his profile and reading the news, he saw an ad for the studio director position for This Week in Startups, and he said, that looks interesting. That podcast, I listened to it. Oh, wow, they have an opening? Let me take a look. Let me just browse browse through this opportunity and you know what happened he clicked and he applied and we found somebody who wasn't looking for a job in a low uh unemployment situation like we have in the united states if people are out there looking they're the last two or three percent of people who are trying to find jobs the most experienced people are in high demand and you want to find those passive job seekers and that's what we did we have hired i think three people now uh, our marketing manager at marine uh, up in toronto and we do this through LinkedIn. So here's what I want you to do. I want to give you $50 right now, a fitty from Jason, linkedin.com slash angel. Go to linkedin.com slash angel and you will get $50 off your first job post, linkedin.com slash angel. It works. It's amazing. I'm telling you this because I want you to find great talent and because I did. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, welcome back to the front that is my podcasting career. On this podcast, I bring people who are smarter than me under the false pretense that they're going to be sharing with you, my audience, their insights, their information, and their wisdom. This is a giant fraud. I am coming clean for the first time. I have people like Matt Ako on the podcast in order to educate me, Jason Calacanis, the mother of all unicorns, one of the greatest angel investors in the world, currently the greatest angel investor active because Chris Saka and Ron Conway are retired. That puts me number one. And you know what? 
I want to get better. And that's what angel investing is about. Constantly forcing yourself to make better and better decisions. Just like the world's greatest poker player, Phil Helmuth, who I play poker with every week. He's trying to make himself better all the time. We have deep conversations about how to get an edge, how to improve your game, how to remove a leak from your game. And that's what we do on this podcast. This podcast is 10 episodes uh, each season. This is our third season. Thank you to our partners for underwriting it because it's not cheap to have a studio. And uh, trust me, Emmy Award winning Jackie, uh, producer Emmy Award winning Jackie, and Sir Charles, uh, they're, they're, not ex they're not cheap to keep those kids around here working at a high level. Okay. My uh, guest today is Matt Ako. He's had an amazing career doing what venture capitalists and investors used to do here in Silicon Valley, which is being brave and making difficult decisions with a lot of uncertainty and lacking a lot of information. Now everybody's a lemming. Everybody wants to see traction. Nobody wants to take any risk in this town. I want to know how you do it, Matt. How do you look at a company and a founder and what questions do you ask them when they say, I want to save babies in NICU from dying using big data. This is a crazy idea. How does one evaluate that? Or you were telling me earlier about a company that wants to take uh, drones that might be used for, say, terrorist activities or illegal activities and take them out of the sky, or big data and sensors to figure out, hey, maybe who's got a bomb in their backpack. How do you do it? How do you find out if this person can actually pull it off? What are the questions you ask? So there, there are a couple of things that, that we look at. Um, the first is we have to understand the difference between, um, rocket science, which is actually funny because we're, we're anchor investors in rocket labs, which, uh, which just had its fifth successful orbital huh. launch Congratulations. Uh, on about one twentieth of the capital Elon, uh, uh, raised to do the same thing, which, yeah. which we're particularly proud of, but we, we don't want to invest in raw science. So we're not ambling around Stanford looking inside of bubbling beakers or, or Berkeley or MIT. There has to be some tangibility to the technology. Got it. But product market fit can be uncertain. That's okay. The, that's the uncertainty that we're willing. To recap, product market fit means the customers love it. Right. And then doing science in a lab means you have you don't have to worry about customers. Customers are left out of the equation. You just got to you have a, a thesis, a theory you want to test, and you're doing the experimental method. So somewhere exactly. between customers saying, I love it, and the uh, experiment that's done just for the efficacy and delight of the scientist. So what does that mean? They build a prototype, or they build a model, or their thesis is so good that you can't help but believe it because of signaling in the world. Take me through an example of how you came to a decision. Yeah, I mean, I can I can give you a couple of examples of uh, seed investments, seed or early A investments that we made in crazy technology that's turned out to have Go ahead. a huge product market fit. Um, one company, Embark, which is a leader in self-driving trucking, um, uh, they demonstrated driving a truck um, effectively driverless. The driver's hands were only on the wheel for five minutes of a roughly 100-hour trip from San Mateo to Jacksonville, Florida, and back. And of those five minutes, almost the entirety of that time, the driver had unreasonably panicked just because they weren't used to a fully autonomous vehicle. Um, it was a company that was recently uh, photographed hauling loads uh, with an Amazon logo on the back. And somewhere along the way of that crushing proof of self-driving uh, trucking superiority, Sequoia became our, our co-investor. and Oh, I think wow. That, Big yeah, deal. I think there are great things ahead for this company. The I actually com have, I have a video of it here. They can pull it up while we're uh, talking yeah. about it. Um, the company in its earliest seed incarnation was uh, was trying to do campus go-karts or small self-driving vehicles. They look like a, 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 a neuro or, um, or, or any of... 73, you know, small to medium self-driving companies. Um, and we were uninterested. And we told the company that. And we walked them 
through our thesis that they were running into a buzzsaw of overfunded competition. And Specifically because they were going after individual cars, consumers. In individual cars or, or, or campus taxis or food delivery, any, any, any of those things. Yeah, um, too crowded. We, we felt we're, we're asking for trouble. And we said, hey, they're, you know, uh, trucking is interesting because uh, it actually has less regulatory overhead. Once you cut the Gordian knot, hmm. which, by the way, this company has, they are cleared to drive on 90% of US highway segments. Wait, wait what's a Gordian knot? There's another term I haven't heard before. Uh, it's is a, that some nerds? Uh... A term, term from Greek, Greek mythology slash history. It was supposedly represented the unsolvable problem in Alexander the Great took huh. out a sword and said, I'll solve the problem and sliced through huh. the Gordian knot huh. and uh, huh. went on to conquer. My, my kind of guy. Yeah, exactly. I like that approach. I, he, he may, he may be, he may be your, your, your uh, spirit animal, your Greek, your yeah. Greek architect. He's probably uh, my ancestor. Yes. Ex exactly. I've solved a number of problems just swinging a sword randomly at them. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, um, they're clear to drive on 90% of us highway segments. We we watched the company move towards being able to do this, mm. and then we made a sizable seed investment, and we had understandable metrics, not SaaS metrics, not mm. you know how many people did you get to use your survey app or or DAU or any of that stuff, mm. but we had bounded technical achievements that would tell us that this company was mm -hmm. going to have a crushing advantage in a well-understood market. Yeah. And they hit all of those and more. So we led to A, and then when they fully rolled out their shock and awe, Sequoia led their B. Got it. So what Shock and awe was what in this case? Well, shock, shock and awe was driving cross-country effectively with, with no driver and actually having commercial contracts for- Freight delivery and, and what fully do we think? autonomous vehicles. So I get it. You, you're looking, you're breaking down the problem into its component parts and saying, hey, um, if they win this, forget about the, you know, delivery or going up against Elon and Waymo uh, with, you know, self-driving cars and taxis and Uber and Lyft. But hey, if they win trucking, there's going to be a unique skill set there. And there's going to be a big prize if they do. If they fail, they fail. Whatever. It's part of the game. Uh, it's whatever, 1% of your fund or 2% of your fund, 3% of your fund. Is that what the average investment represents of fund size? No, it's, 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 it, can be, it can be smaller than that. We actually still do honest to God seed. What is honest to God seed in 2019 here in Silicon Valley? 100K, 250K. Wow. Um, Why have the top VC firms, leaving names aside, fled the seed space and gone on to say, hey, we got to put 10 million to work. We need to own 25% of your company. We need to put 50 million to work. What happened? We, I, when, I came, when I started doing this 10 years ago, less than half the time you've been doing it, everybody loved writing 250, 500K exploratory checks. Now it's like everybody left the party and it's just like five of us on the dance floor. Right. And the music's great. The DJ's <laughs> killing it. I'm loving it. It's literally like we have so much room to on the dance floor. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm I'm on your email list, and I I can see why you're salivating. Um, it is perplexing. So, it, it is very labor intensive, mm. and in fairness to our, you know, our our big brothers. I mean, it's ironic. former contemporaries. Yeah, well, it's it's ironic because we're tiptoeing towards managing a, a a couple billion in AUM, but our our bigger brothers are managing many times that. So, yeah, um, we're we're still. Ironically, very much the small kid uh, on, on the block. In, in fairness to them, um, in more trafficked areas, um, there's also a signaling risk, mm -hmm. ironically. You would think that with more people wanting to invest in SaaS or lightweight enterprise uh, or consumer, that there would be less signaling risk. But there are so few firms that stand on top of the heap mm -hmm. in each of those areas that if they don't follow on in an experimental check, which is what we call them. We call them experiments. Right. Um, Small check. You get to know the founder. You get to see them up close and personal. And because you have skin in the game, your eyes are going to be a little more open than just in a meeting. Is that right? Absolutely. And everything about their supply chain, 
regulatory issues, customer sales issues, friction, every CTO, every chief science officer, every patent issue, every technology issue, you name it. It's like being a high frequency trading guy, um, sending out a little, you know, pseudo trade every four microseconds, except we get the equivalent of months to years mm. of investment understanding. And that's the reason that we still continue to do uh, to do small investments. The entrepreneur does actually get the benefit of mm. the full weight of our firm and they can ask for our help at any time, but we generally don't take board seats mm. when we do that. Th those things. That's a different. Yeah, that's going to be super time consuming to be on a board and do it properly. And the way that we diligence is with a very unusual model. Oh. Uh, it requires. Hold on. I want to know that diligence model for the small size checks when we get back on the Angel Podcast. One of the most important things for you to do for your startup is to have insurance. I don't know if you've been through this before, but I have errors and omission and cyber. That means if you get attacked and you get hacked, which everybody's uh, unfortunately experiencing these days, and DNO. You've heard DNO. You've heard your investors throw it around. What does it mean? Directors and officers. That means the people on your board are covered in case the company gets sued because of a cyber attack or an HR issue, whatever it is. You need to have errors and omissions. You need to have DNO and you need to have cyber. Well, the Embroker Startup Program helps startups do this, and I went through it with the founder. It is so easy. You just take a couple of minutes, you answer a couple of very easy to do questions, and you will get your insurance priced out immediately. You'll have access to 50 of the top carriers and Embroker's proprietary insurance policies. It's white glove service from expert brokers who specialize in high growth companies like yours. So you can instantly build your custom insurance right now and you'll save up to 20% if you go to embroker.com slash angel. That's E-M and then the word broker, E-M-B-R-O-K-E-R.com slash angel, embroker.com slash angel. You need to get all this stuff dialed in. You need to do it right. Maybe you've been growing fast and you didn't get this set up because you're too busy. Well, it's time to take a pause and go to embroker.com slash angel, get that cyber insurance going. Hey, they even do things like cannabis and other insurance. Go to their website. You'll see it all at embroker.com slash angel. Instantly buy that DNO, ENO cyber coverage in minutes, not weeks. That's the big thing here. Not only are you to save money with Embroker, but you're going to save weeks and months of nonsense waiting for brokers to call you back and give you a quote, and they probably bait and switch you and charge you too much. So use embroker.com slash angel my good friend matt akko i consider us friends absolutely we we've known each other for the better part of 20 years man we like each other yes we like each other we talk indeed we've seen a couple movies together indeed uh, we've wandered the streets of new york wandered the streets i mean we 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 like each other i think why do we like each other what is it we're are you an east coast or what is it we're just candid no bullshit people what is it born Born and raised on on the East Coast, uh, uh, low low tolerance for for politics and nonsense. Yes, you yeah. and I get a, get along on that. We're going to talk about politics in the third segment. Hold on to your because it does relate because our industry is being looked at through the lens of politics. But you said you have a framework for how to cut those hundred k, two hundred fifty k, very difficult checks. This is sometimes the hardest check to write because you have the least information, but you're also on the hook for now being connected to that person as an investor. Yep. Why is that a big deal for for investors like us? Well, so let's let's start out with yeah. with the issue of diligence, yeah. right? It's very easy if you're doing 250k checks to just throw spaghetti against the wall. And as you know, the statistics actually don't work in an investor's favor. No, spray and pray does not work. Exactly. So in in, in as an isolated investment thesis. Exactly. So when we built our firm, we realized that we actually had to do real diligence mm. on even the smallest checks. So what we did was we surrendered a significant portion of our carry to folks that we call equity partners. Got it. These are world-class CTOs, chief science officers, Nobel Prize shortlisters, heads of entire university uh, departments, three, four times successful entrepreneurs. We have 70 of them hmm. across our firm with real carry. They are not venture partners. 
They don't fight each other over specific deals. Ah. It is one for all, all for one. And for the billionaires among them, the act of respect of actually giving them carry instead of a disdainful bottle of Burgundy after mm. they helped with something all the way through IPO uh, resulted in a lot of loyalty. What is it, like half your carry you give them, a third? Or? In, in our very first fund, it was close to half. Wow. And um, even in our larger funds, it's still a sizable, sizable handful of, of wow. points. Now, do they get it individually or do they each get 170th of that pool? They, it sounds like a scout program, which I was obviously yeah. the first Sequoia scout, um, famously. Um, so, or not so famously, depending on how you look at should history. Should be famously. I feel it should be famous <laughs> considering the numbers I put up. But I guess to people watching this, maybe it doesn't seem like actual legitimate fame. But for me, it is. <laughs> Fair point. Do they split it evenly or do they get like the juice themselves or is there a pool or both? They're, 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 they're two tiers. There's no political games. Mm -hmm. And- of the sizable chunk that's allocated to them, everybody participates in either one or the other of the two tiers. Great. Effectively yeah. pro rata. It's really interesting because in the Sequoia investments, Sam did Stripe, Sam Altman, and I did Uber and uh, Data Stacks and Thumbtack. And there are people who were part of that first 20 scout group who did either no investments or very like one. Right. And they will wind up making six to seven figures in co-carry because they put a little 5% pool on the side right. of a shared pool. So I'll get 5% of you know Sam's uh, carry for Stripe and everybody will get 5% of my Uber, data stacks, and Thumbtack, which is quite meaningful. Yes. Uh, so this has resulted in you using them as a lens, these experts, and you pick them based on historical relationships or do you actually go out and scout scouts as Bo it were both so yeah. it's it's accreted re accreted credibility and relationship with world class experts mm. um which is why it's very hard for a, a very young fund um or a fund of very young people to do this because they don't have 20 year relationships with world class experts generally um but we also do look for people on a kind of deliberate basis to enhance this group. We're not churning and burning people. They're very loyal to us. We're very loyal to them. But this is a massive force multiplier for our ability to quickly and thoroughly vet almost any technology that you can imagine. And also, even the professors have done at least one, two, sometimes three or more companies. So they're also good judges of people. All of these people are high IQ. So it's almost like you Sorry, took- Sorry, high EQ. EQ, yeah. Yeah. The, it's almost like you took what people used to hire, I understand, experts to diligence deals. So back in the early days of Silicon Valley, they would hire a scientist to go take a look at the thing and then just pay them $5,000 or $1,000 right. for like a day of work. And it was like the cushiest deal with these- diligence folks didn't realize was like that 5,000 might make a decision that might make 5 million, right? 50 million or 500 million, who knows? Um, do people still hire diligence experts like that? Does that exist in Silicon Valley? Have you ever heard of it? And did you see it when you were earlier in your career? Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was something that large funds did as part of a, a diligence checklist and some still do. In the same way that we don't believe that it's wise to have a segregated seed fund mm. because of the intellectual and communication barriers between the people who mm. bury themselves in that for a living and then the people who run the next stack of capital. We also don't believe that you should outsource uh, a ton of your diligence mm. to outside experts, which is why we created this. Why not? You don't you don't get accreted knowledge. You don't mm. get historical. Um, wow. uh, you, you don't get uh, uh, institutional memory. I think is the word phrase that right. I'm I'm looking for. But also, um, almost everybody. In fact, I would argue everybody um, in our firm is a nerd. Mm. Um, we're you know um, we we don't own sports teams or multiple Ferraris or you know. Uh, um, small fleets of planes or anything like that. We Lots of Teslas, I'm assuming. Yeah, uh, uh, one, mine, Elise. <laughs> um, and uh, we don't, um, 
we're really very boring people. Mm. We build deep tech companies. We have our our spouses or significant others, our kids, where that applies, and a small circle of of close friends. If we're out at dinner, we're talking about papers from the Association of Computing Machinery or mm. IEEE or Nature, or we're talking about a really cool deal in somebody else's portfolio that just had an amazing mm. breakthrough. And so that inner nerd flywheel is massively amplified by the equity partner nerd mm-hmm. flywheel. Got they it. inform each other, they support each other, and we accrete knowledge. And this mm-hmm. kind of virtuous spiral, mm-hmm. so self-sustaining competitive advantage is also what we look for in these deep tech companies. Fascinating. So you've modeled your firm after a deep tech company in that the capital and the innovation and all that knowledge just feeds back into it. So having the diligence in-house, having these uh, scouts, you call them- uh, Equity partners. Equity partners who are deep tech. You have this incredible bench uh, and that leads to the data collective collecting data, which then gives you an edge. And your edge is the data and the deep science because you're all nerds and you all want to read papers and get to first principles and, and and really look for the bigger opportunities that are difficult to attack. Exactly. Speaking very, of- very few of any of us will ever be invited to give a super slick TED talk, right? Um, or or to uh, or to or to pose for um, a you cover. Know, to pose for any kind of Take cover. Take me to the first time <laughs> you met Elizabeth Holmes, and what was the pitch like? You know, I actually can't recall meeting Elizabeth Holmes, okay. but I remember meeting a friend. Of, uh, no, a friend of hers. No, I remember meeting a mutual friend who was unreasonably excited. Huh. Um, and I said, okay, this sounds really impressive. And they've already rolled out. And I said, great. Put me on the IRB. Right? Yeah, explain what IRB is. Um, so uh, uh, an, an, an IRB is the initial list of, uh, it's both a regulatory process um, and approval mechanism and the list of patients effectively. Mm. So if you're, if you're in the IRB, you're an approved patient under an uh, IRB got it. approval. Um, uh, so for example, if somebody is, very early on in testing a new medical device at Stanford, hmm. they would file for an IRB. Uh, an IRB panel would consider the ethical and medical implications of what they were trying to do yeah. and then approve a subset of propo- of a proposed patient population that could be hmm. part of an experiment um, uh, or trial. Um, so anyway, I-, I said, you know, get me into the get me into the IRB group and I'll try it out and I'll consider an investment. It never happened. And the excuses became ah. the excuses became more and more exotic. <laughs> and so eventually I I concluded that it was a fraud. The it's the other so thing, the, the other thing is everybody from phlebotomists at LabCorp that I just kind of randomly asked about it when I was getting a physical to Distinguished scientists at Stanford and MIT and Caltech and Berkeley and whatnot said it probably is physically impossible with any set of technology available in the next 20 years to extract that volume of information and to perform that many tests that accurately on that small a volume of blood. It, you literally cannot overcome the the errors. It would be like Elon coming out and being like, yeah, this is a 5,000 mile battery. And you're just like, what? 5,000 miles? Wasn't the last one like 150? Like h- how did how did we make that crazy step function? Did you like build a fusion engine or yeah, did it, you 100X solar panels and put them on the roof? Like it doesn't make any sense. And people still fell for it. What What's the lesson there in the Theranos debacle? What You didn't fall for it. None of the other VCs of note in Silicon Valley did, to be honest. Like I know many oh, VCs yeah. who they weren't able to see the core technology and they were like sign an NDA and it was so stealthy. Everybody was just like, oh, this is probably not real. We, we all ran. Everybody in Silicon Valley ran. It looks like a Silicon Valley disaster story, but, but it's, it's not. A, it's not. not a Silicon Valley disaster story. It is a... It is a... 
it, it is more like the female version of the talented Mr. Ripley. Mm. It is a nice blonde white girl. Yeah. And that's, it's important to note if she were a woman of color yeah. or, or, or openly gay, mm-hmm. it is highly unlikely that she would have been given the endless courtesies and credulity mm. that was necessary for her to, to perform this scam. So this is a nice lily white girl from a quote unquote good family right who scammed a bunch of even wealthier people dipshits well we're not te- in, even in the tech business but it you know it's it's literally like some genteel you know Newport Rhode Island scam he it's a grifter yes these are grifters it's what people don't realize like they they look at it as like the example of Silicon Valley gone awry and Silicon Valley eating itself or being it's literally a grifter with a Shvengali lover this Balwani guy who was her lover yeah people forget like it's even more debaucherous and insane and creepy and creepy when her number two is her lover and they're both on the board and the board doesn't know that the two of them are in a relationship. And that is critically important disclosure because they're obviously as significant others at the time going to behave in a certain way. And I agree with your assessment that if she hadn't been the tall blonde with the crazy blue eyes that pattern matched. But to me, when I saw it, I knew it was a fraud from the moment they said dropped out of Stanford going for her whatever biology degree, pre-med, whatever it was going to be. And I just thought to myself, oh, I would not want my pilot or my brain surgeon to drop out of school. Right. But I I have no problem with you building a web app because you dropped out of school and they were teaching you Fortran and Pascal in college. And you just thought, you know what? I should learn CSS and JavaScript and whatever. Like that totally makes sense. But I dropped out. To create a blood testing company, right? Or I dropped out to do brain surgery, right? Faster and quicker and more right. innovative. Like I'm not looking for an innovative, you know, brain tumor removal technique that just flies against and disrupts the entire, bi- you know, face of biology. No, thank you. Right, right. What have you passed on that has the anti-portfolio pain? It's time, Matt. What have you passed on? What have you been in the room, been pitched, and that you just Grind your teeth and you're, when you're at your offsite with your partnership talking about how brilliant you are and the flywheel you've created of capital and expertise and knowledge and deep tech and you're high-fiving yourself. But then the part when you have to be self-reflective at that offsite because all these VCs do these crazy offsites where you have to kumbaya and figure out how you exist. What are the names that come up in the anti-portfolio that just make you bang your head against the desk and say, I am terrible at this um i'll tell you mine yeah so so the weird thing is most of my anti portfolio is in my non dcvc investment realm got it um so they're not deep tech yeah. they're, they're not deep tech we're i mean mm. look every everybody misses stuff but you know w- we haven't passed on any you know 10 billion dollar incipient um uh incipient unicorns and and it's a it's a long game um i'm not going to name names some friends of ours had a phenomenal uh multi multi billion dollar exit in deep tech we're really happy for them they're trusted co-investors um we love the team and we're cheering them on because it means they'll raise another big fund and we can do more stuff together we passed on that because the very the core application for the technology was already fully obsoleted by a stealthier company in our portfolio. So, ah, so in, conflict. Not not conflict. It, it, they do radically different things, ah. but would you invest in an autonomous driving company as sexy as it might be if you had a stealth portfolio company that actually had practical teleportation? Right. Right? No. Di- right. Di- right. Di- I, I've invested in a VTOL company and it right. works. And I've been in the veto, the vertical takeoff and landing. I've flown across the lake. I know that self-driving, you know, cars are going to be toast when the VTOLs come out. No, of course I wouldn't. Yes. Right. So because it's such a long game in deep tech, mm. your friends can have huge successes and you're not bitter or jealous or, or 
put it necessarily in the anti-portfolio because you might have something just as big and beefy Got it. that's going to leapfrog So they them. won the hand now, but you might win the longer hand. I get it. Exactly. So what about the ones you missed that right. were not in your thesis? Because this is a really interesting discussion of should you have a thesis or not? And my position is different than yours. I am anti having a thesis because I believe that the best companies often are only fit into a thesis in the review mirror. Right. I.e., on demand, when the word on demand was codified, the was opportunity to invest <laughs> in Postmates and, you know, Lyft and Uber and Airbnb was over. It was six, seven years later than some journalist was like, I know what we can call this. Or I heard a venture capitalist call it on demand or whatever you called enterprise, like lightweight enterprise or yeah. whatever that would you call it lightweight enterprise? Fluffy enterprise. Fluffy enterprise. <laughs> non deep tech. Shallow enterprise. Yeah. All right. So take us through your why the thesis made you miss blank. Yeah. So actually, um, I I would say not so much a failure of judgment, um, but uh, maybe adherence to ethics mm. is painful. Um, uh very early on, extremely early on in his career, um, a uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, in the consumer space introduced me to a young man named Evan Spiegel, uh -huh. uh, and he sat on my couch and said, "Yeah, I'm I'm having some friction with my very earliest uh, investors, and you know I've got kind of this crazy note structure. It's not a lot of money." This mutual friend and a couple of other people have said really good things about you. And, you know, I see that you were early on in Zynga and a couple of other uh, uh, consumer companies. Um, could you buy out my note and become my largest investor? Yeah. And I said no. Right. And I said no because I was in the middle of slogging through raising right. what fortuitously in the end was a very oversubscribed day job DCVC fund. But I said, if you're mad at people for being unavailable or quirky or, you know, exhibiting, you know, the, the negative uh, propensities of, of, of VCs, mm. I'm going to be just as bad. I might be friendlier or I might, you know, crack more puns when right. you finally get a hold of me, but I'm going to disappoint you. I can't in good conscience do this. I'm just going to piss you off. Yeah, so to buy out a previous investor who they're not happy with, which I think was Lightspeed, uh, it's public knowledge, but well, who knows if that's true or not? No, 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 no comment on who it was. No comment on who it was. Light, you can look light, it up on the internet. Lightspeed or friends references and, and trusted co-investors. Yes. Uh, well, that's interesting because you didn't want to get them off the cap table, take their spot, and then be sharp elbowed like that. I also just didn't want to piss off the entrepreneur yeah. by replacing. One set of folks who might have very good reasons for making him annoyed mm. um, with somebody who is going to say and do the exact same stuff. Right. And um, now the good news is that um, uh, even though Snap is not real at all our thing in our day job, um, I have had other companies that have dealt with them. Mm. And the goodwill from not being uh, a, a predatory shithead, yeah, um, uh, has redounded to mm. uh, to my benefit, and I yeah. still have a good relationship with um, with uh, with. So Evan you left three hundred, four hundred, five hundred million on the table, but hey, your reputation went up a little bit. Exactly. Uh, there's a lot of uh, hand wringing right now about socialism uh, and anti capitalism bent. Um, in America, <clears throat> what's your take? Um, capitalism broken, socialism yeah. the solution. I, I honestly think they're both broken. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, since so you, you can uh, confirm that socialism yeah. is, <laughs> continues to not work. Okay, since, good. Since, since you want, since you want to pick on socialism, um, socialism in any pure form. Meaning when it's not social democracy, when you strip capitalism out of it, when you get Cuba, Venezuela, Cambodia, mm. um, Russia under Stalin, yeah. um, 
the 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 quip that I make about socialism is that we are all absolutely equal. Dot 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 in the grave. Hmm. Um, now that being said, laissez-faire capitalism is also immensely destructive, um, immensely extractive, hmm. immensely um, <clears throat> uh, exploitative. Hmm. Uh, in its operation. And it also stops being real capitalism. It becomes uh, a form of, of um, there's a good Greek word, kakiostocracy. Hmm. It becomes an oligarchy of thieves. Right. Because you get regulatory capture, hmm. right? Like the banks who committed horrific crimes against- And all got bailed out. Uh, right. All got bailed out. No one went to jail, right? Right. So capitalism without any guardrails <clears throat> equals eventually taking over the government because right. the government can be bought and then it starts to tip over into an unfair capitalist looking society, which are we there here in America, do you think? Or are we halfway there? We we are we are tiptoeing towards an outcome like the movie Elysium hmm. in which the unfair advantages of the one tenth or one hundredth of one percent become perpetually cemented mm. by having exponential technological firepower and a relatively inexpensive surveillance state at their disposal. Yeah. And and I don't I don't want that future. The reason that I am a a quote unquote capitalist is I believe that capitalism is the most efficient path towards something that uh, uh, I call, and I think a few other uh, folks have called, radical abundance. Radical abundance. Radical abundance. It's it's it sounds utopian, but there is no reason that we can't live in a Star Trek future. Ultimately, capitalism wants to drive stuff towards a stable cost. Why shouldn't the stable cost of a safe society, enough to eat, a quality of opportunity in education, in finance, in housing, be Near zero. Yeah. It's not like there's a shortage of atoms mm. in the universe. Yeah. It's not like there's a shortage of energy in the universe. See, I, and if those two are your inputs to almost everything that I described, why shouldn't it be freaking free? It should be, because when you think about it, I, <clears throat> I, um, when I run for president, my platform is going to be free energy, free water, and free produce and vegetables for everybody. Because I think that we're at the moment where we're about to capture that. If you look, free energy, it's we're so close, right? Solar, wind, everything, nuclear, new nuclear. Then you look at clean water. Everybody's panicked about clean water. It's like Israel and the Middle East is like all desalinization. It costs like a fraction of a penny to desalinate a gallon of water. People are in panic about water. I get it. You don't want to waste water. Well, we're we're driving that. We both we have both a new nuclear company. And a radical desalination company. Merge then, the companies and then they should just be called the energy water company. It's yeah. like there'll be, and if you have unlimited energy and water, you can put robots in a field to make vegetables for free. We're, we're you know, I have Cafe X as an investment making, you know, uh, food for people and taking people away from the misery of having to make t 12 hours of coffee a day for a bunch of precious people who want to set the temperature and the milk froth level. Like a robot should do that, not humans. Exactly. And those same robots are going to be in the fields, pulling the stuff out of the earth for pennies. And right now, it, it turns out in the last 30 years for inflation, like food and other things, like if you take a 15 hour, if you work 15 hours, do you know how much rice and vegetables and basic proteins you could buy for that? It'd be days. Right. Days of sustenance. Right. So just on like, the problem is we're not looking at it as days of sustenance anymore. We're looking at it as what car I drive, what phone I upgrade cycle, like our desire to have things has surpassed our like contentment with having a roof and food over our over our heads. It's a very weird moment. I, I, I agree. And if, again, if you look at what we're up to, yeah, we have a company that has demonstrated it can annihilate the two hundred and twelve billion dollar chemical fertilizer industry. Perfect. With something clean, doesn't generate ocean and lake nitrogen What's killing that runoff. Company? Uh, that company is called Pivot Bio. Pivot Bio. Non GMO, computationally bred huh. bacteria that make corn, wheat, rice, and soy self fertilizing. 
Perfect. For a growing season. By the way, Monsanto's outside. They're going to whack you. <laughs> uh, actually, Monsanto was our co-investor because oh, great. The, the senior leadership in the company had, to their credit, yeah. a change of heart and said, we need to drive massive innovation in non-GMO areas. Um, it's interesting you say that because I went to Monsanto. I did a visit there because um, they bought a friend of mine's company. And we, we visited and- they're kind of like I don't understand why everybody hates us. Like we we feed the world. We're kind of trying to feed the world, and we're 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 agnostic. If people want to buy organic stuff and not buy the <clears> chemical <throat> stuff, or if they want to buy hybrid or non hybrid, but like we've been hybriding everything on this planet for a long time. Humans, dogs, right. everything is a hybrid. Right. Like taking two different husks of corn and you know letting the bigger ones with the better you know result and the and the better outcome like. Why wouldn't you hybrid those and make bigger, stronger mules or corn or whatever? Uh, tell me about nuclear. Yeah, I mean- uh, This AOC with the green yeah, deal and uh, they took nuclear out of it is so dumb. <clears throat> Both Bo, Bo Zach Bogue, my, my co-founder and co-managing partner and I are big fans of nuclear. If you, uh, There's a guy named Mike Schellenberger who mm -hmm. writes for Forbes who does a phenomenal job on this. Um, the number of people- who have and are going to continue dying from the coal and gas and oil plants Ugh. necessary to provide true baseload power to purportedly green solar and wind is dramatically higher than the total number of people that could potentially ever be killed by the entire nuclear industry. Assume as many meltdowns. Yes, a Chernobyl as, and a Fukushima <clears throat> every month. It's not going to kill as many people as coal is actively killing now. It's so obvious. And you look at Fukushima. Uh, that was a very old reactor. We're talking what 1950s, 60s design, yeah. and Im implemented in the 70s, maybe. <clears throat> they put it below sea level. They were told, "Don't put." Nuclear reactors, be, so they were told not to do that. Right. They built a seawall. They said, well, what if the seawall breaks? What are, you understand, salt water plus nuclear reactor from the 70s, not a good combination. Exactly. And these idiots, I'm sorry, there is somebody who should have gone to jail over this. The fact that they kept that reactor running, is, I mean, it wouldn't have kept people from dying from the tsunami. They would have still died. A tsunami right. is a tsunami. If people choose to live on the lowlands, it, it, that's the tragedy that every 200 years, some random act can happen. But to put a nuclear reactor in harm's way is unconscionably stupid. I agree. We could have reactors all over this country, all over China, all over Africa, and we're, they're going to be in Africa and China, just not in our country. Well, so-, so We're going to get any in our country? Yeah. So let's actually talk about that. So the company that-, that um that we backed with um, a very famous multi-billionaire uh, idiosyncratic investor who is not Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> that, that's a uh, yeah, they're they're five okay. or they're five or six to pick from. Um, uh... <laughs> uh, the this reactor is provably physically safe. It is physically impossible to have a meltdown. Right. It fits on the back of a truck. It's the size of a container. Right. Can generate five to fifteen megawatts. A free, in effect, million BTU of instantaneous heat for chemical and industrial processes and for desalination independent of the electricity it generates. Yum, yum. It's basically lights out, almost no human intervention. It burns waste. So you can show up at Fukushima or Three Mile Island and say, give me your scariest stuff. Yeah. And we're going to turn it into fuel. Love it. It is proliferation and terror proof. So mm -hmm. you can't saw it apart and scamper off with bad stuff. Mm -hmm. You can basically take it off the back of a truck and give any village to portion of a large metropolis power for a hundred years. And, and nobody can chainsaw it and pull out the, few, no, the material. Absolutely not. It's sealed. It's sealed. Which makes obvious sense that that would be possible. It It, it is not only possible, but they are 
within spitting distance of getting final uh, final approval to actually. I got to get in on this company, man. Can, uh, what, we're they going to do another bridge round or something. Can I get a taste? Can, How do I can, get in on this? Can, consider, can we take it offline? Consider yourself in, my friend. Okay, we, we, thank you. We, we'd, we'd love to have you. All right, listen, Matt. It's been an incredible hour, and an hour has gone by. We need to have you back, uh, and uh, also we got to get your partner on here at some point. Zach is a little podcast shy. I'll get him. He's he's much more charismatic than I am, and in fact, on that nuclear point. He really has taken leadership uh, on on a global basis on the regulatory level. Really, this is what I want to get in on. I want to get in on some nuclear action. I think we are such emotional creatures uh, as a species, and when we start thinking like people think on Twitter or these hysterical pearl clutching maniacs. Uh, who are reactionary, we're not making the logical, intelligent decision about energy. The logical decision is to put as many nuclear reactors in the world as quickly as possible because they don't burn a hole in the ozone. They don't release carbon at the levels of, I don't right. think there's any carbon, right? They all, Also, something that people ignore is as much as I love solar and I believe it's a really important part, and we need to continue to inv invest and innovate in it. Most current solar panels and the next five to 10 years of solar involve some level of rare earths, involves a whole bunch of CO2 generating mining. Mm. They're very difficult, if not outright toxic to recycle or yeah. unrecyclable. There are challenges. And for, for folks who say, you know, wind is going to be fine. You can't accept the reality of climate change, which massively destabilizes wind patterns. Yeah, great. You put you, you put the windmills, you spent a billion dollars putting windmills in Texas. There's no more wind. The wind <laughs> moved. <laughs> exactly. Or, yeah. you, or you have, you know, 200 mile an hour super storms, which- Would rip the which, things which, off. Yeah, yeah the you, wings you, off them, you don't, the blades. You, you don't want 150 foot, you know, ultra sharp composite blades in, uh, in that kind of storm. So you need nuclear. Um and uh and why not why not build this is i like to build extra capacity here's what i would do i would build the 100 year plan not this like 10 20 year fakaka nonsense yeah let's just decide we have why not have the abundance we talked about why not make energy go to zero this would be a massive competitive advantage for america if we just said we're going to put 50 new nuclear plants in america and coal is the backup and natural gas is the backup to the renewables backup, and now nuclear is the primary. And we now have unlimited. So when you're truck driving or Teslas or other electric cars, what if filling your Tesla was free? What if America gave an energy dividend to everybody? Talk about basic income. Yeah. What if every business didn't have to pay for their electrical starting next month? You're, you're singing our song, man. This would be the abundance we need. Yeah. Because then people would say, oh, you know what? We Our manufacturing plan for making jeans, you know, 7% of our, 7% uh, of what we're doing is energy to keep the lights on here. Okay, we have no more energy costs? Great. We'll give everybody a 3%, 4% raise. Then they go spend that money and monetary velocity goes up. People start spending more money. Absolutely. You, you <laughs> God damn it, people. Oh. Why are people not listening to us? Are, Matt? are, are you are you applying for a stealth partner position at DCVC? You know what? It's interesting. You're, you're, a, you can a be a people, dollar a year, man. You know, I'm kind of like having. I don't. You follow the NBA at all? A I'm kind of like having Rodman or or Rashid Wallace on your team. Like that might be an interesting experiment for a season or three. And you might it might wind up. I might rip a lot of rebounds down, but I also might make the team implode. Like you really don't need a guy like me on your team. Trust me. I'm a solo act by design. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you about signing up as an equity partner. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Uh, everybody follow Matt Ako. Oko or Ako? Ako. Ako. Yeah. O-C-K-O. Ako. Um, and what does Ako mean, by the way? What's the origin of that? I always ask people the origin of their last names. It's, that... it's a very, very old uh, uh, Russo-Slavic ah. name, originally Ochko. Cyrillic O, Cyrillic K, Cyrillic O, Ochko. meaning I or one who sees. Um, so, how appropriate yeah a um, lot, lot of weird history behind behind the name the weirdest one I'll leave you with this the the Archbishop of Prague was Jan Akko mm. and my dad Dr. Jonathan Akko used to be in Prague on business and try to get a restaurant reservation and he spoke a little bit of Russian slash yeah. Czech slash Slavic and they would say 
oh yes, it'd be lovely to see you at this, you yeah. know, nice little bistro tonight. And they'd say, What's your name? And he would say appropriately in in, in Slavic, you know, Jan Alko. Um, <laughs> and they'd hang up on him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. All right. Continued success. Follow uh, Matt O C K O on the Twitter. He's good on Twitter. He's got an opinion. He's got a thesis. He's putting it to work. Congratulations to your LPs. Maybe I can sneak in and be a little mini LP here. All right. We'll see you next time on Angel the Podcast. You can visit angelpodcast.com. And if you write a review, that's awesome for our ratings. If you spread the word and just email this link, you watch this podcast, you got a ton of value, you made it to the end. Do me a favor. Just say to like 10 other founders, 10 other angel investors, 10 other VCs, just forward the link and say, great interview, J. Cal and Matt. What more do you need to know? All right. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> 